Good morning. It's lovely to be here and it's lovely to sing those songs of praise and worship, adoration, remembrance. Songs that aren't just um, fluff and bubble, but built on biblical, solid theology. We sing theology. And so thank you to Benji for leading us in those songs and choosing them and directing our hearts and minds to theological truths. And now having sung about these truths, we will read and meditate on them as well. And it's great that um, we've had this time of communion. It's reminded us about who we are, why we are who we are. And more importantly, that we are waiting for the Lord's return. Phil said and closed with, till he returns. And I'm glad that we, we are thinking about that because that is a large chunk of what I want to be talking about today. And so, as we continue our study in, on the pursuits that um, characterize genuine believers, the pursuit I would like us to consider today um, goes by many names. You could call it the pursuit of sobriety or the pursuit of vigilance. You could call it the pursuit of battle readiness. But for reasons I will elaborate on as we progress is, I'd like to title this, the pursuit of watchfulness. It refers to our need to be ready, alert, aware of how we live as Christians. We want to be watchful over our own hearts and our own lives. There are many passages also that we could have visited to cover this subject, and I hope to cover some of them today in our, in our time. But for the purpose of our study, I've chosen a text that I hope will elaborate and make very clear as to what this pursuit of watchfulness constitutes. What does it look like in our lives? And more importantly, why pursue it? Why is this pursuit of watchfulness an important pursuit for those of us who profess and name the name of Christ? And so if you have your Bible or your Bible device, please turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we will consider the first 11 verses. These are part of Paul's closing remarks to the Thessalonian church, to the saints at Thessalonica. Please follow along as I read, and as you read, recognize, please, that this is God's true and inerrant word. It is something that he has spoken himself by the pen of people like you and me. It is, it is the word not of man, but of the living God who created the universe. Let that sink in for a minute. May God humble our hearts and minds so that we may understand the clear instruction of his word and may he give us grace to understand it and apply it in our lives so that he gets all the glory. So as per the NASB, and you can uh, follow it on the screen, or you can look at it in your own Bible. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 to 11 reads thus. Now as to the times and the epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. Verse 4, but you, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day would overtake you like a thief. Why? For you all are sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness, so then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. And there you have those words which indicate watchfulness. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, once again, Paul repeats, let us be sober having put on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, 
the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. In verse 11, therefore encourage one another and build up one another, just as you also are doing. Shall we commit this time in prayer? Our gracious God and loving Father, we come before you with awe and reverence. Lord, as we have sung, how can we draw near to the one the angels fear? It's not just a poem, it's not just something that rhymes, but it is a truth and a reality. Father, we just pray that the importance and the significance of this would just drill down into our hearts. How can we draw near to you who are holy utterly set apart, transcendent. Father God, we just pray that the awesomeness of who you are and the wretchedness of our own sinful state from which you have rescued us, Father, would really cause us to ponder and pause to recognize what you have done and therefore how we ought to live and therefore why we need to be watchful. Speak to us in the quietness of our hearts. Speak to us in the parts of our hearts that need to be confronted by your truth, by your love, by your grace, and Lord, even by your anger. Speak to us, humble us, and let us respond in a way that brings you glory. We ask all this in the name and holy and matchless name of your majestic Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Just to um, give you some context or observations, the passage has two aspects that jump out even if you are just a casual observer. The first obvious reference is that reference is being made to a future event. But it's an event that's a bit of a paradox. Because whilst the event is certain, it is inevitable, it is unavoidable, it is inescapable, it is guaranteed to happen, and yet it comes as a shock. It is un unanticipated, it is unexpected. How can something which is so sure Guaranteed, inevitable, unavoidable, inescapable, come as a shock. How is it something can be so certain and sudden at the same time? This brings us to our second observation around the text that there are two distinct groups of people being talked about. What is inevitable for one group comes as a shock to the other. What is assured and certain for one group comes as a surprise to the other. That which is definite and guaranteed for one group is not even on the radar of the other. Put simply, the paradox is because one group is intentionally watchful, vigilant, aware, What's the other group is deliberate in its ignorance. One group chooses to be vigilant. One group chooses to be negligent. One group makes a conscious effort to live carefully, and the other almost seems like they're making it a point to live rashly. So the message of this text, whilst being an encouragement to the watchful ones, will also be a message of confrontation and challenge as well to those who are neglectful. And I'm quite certain that in the group that we have here today, we have a mix of that group. Those who are watchful and those who are neglectful. I don't know, I can't make an assessment as to which group you belong, but I believe you would know that. So whilst it will be my endeavor to comfort you and assure you and inspire you and even excite you perhaps, there will also be moments where you would need to self-assess, evaluate, self-examine. 
And I don't preach this from a, 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 a position on, on, or pedestal that is high above you. I preach it as someone who is amongst you. I preach it to my own heart. Because whilst I am confident of the group that I am in, I am also aware of the necessity to be watchful and vigilant over my own heart. And I believe that's what Paul is doing here in this letter to the Thessalonians. He is commending them, he is applauding them for their faithfulness and their faith, and which is so well known in all of Macedonia and all the surrounding regions. People know about the faith of the saints of Thessalonica. Chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, You also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. It's a commendation. Chapter 2, verse 13, When you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but, what, but for what it really is, the word of God. That's how you accepted it. Commendation. Chapter 4, verse 9 and 10, Now as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you. You've got this sussed. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. For indeed, you do practice it toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, to excel, excel still more. Commendation. And then in our text, we see, But let us be alert and sober. A word of caution. So Paul's call to be watchful and sober, I want you to understand, is not like it's being given to a church that's drifting. His word is not uh, like he, he spoke to the Corinthians, which needed discipline. Apparently, this is not a church that needed discipline. They were solid, grounded. But he is cautioning the very people he commends. And that's really important to study, to understand in the study of the pursuit of watchfulness, that it is the faithful who need to be watchful. You need to let that sink in, and I can't state how important that is. It is the, it is the faithful who need to be watchful. And so keeping that context in mind, I would like us to consider four aspects of the pursuit of watchfulness. Four aspects. Watchfulness is about conformity. Specifically, are you conforming yourself to the word of God or to the dictates of culture? We see that in verses 1 and 3. Watchfulness is about consistency. Specifically, is your conduct consistent with the word of God? We see that in verses 4 and 7. Is your, is your conduct consistent with your identity as a believer? Number three, watchfulness is about being combat ready. Specifically, are you aware that you are at war? Do you even know that? And if you do, are you appropriately armed? We see that in verse 8. And lastly, watchfulness is about confidence. Specifically, are you confident not just about the future, but about eternity? We see that in verses 9 and 10. We see there's a progression in Paul's argument from conformity to con confidence because the more we conform to the word of God, the more consistent our walk becomes with our identity as believers. The more consistent we become, the more battle ready, the more combat ready we are. And the more combat ready we are, the more confident we are. And so we need to really understand this idea and this aspect of conformity as being a part of, of watchfulness, and that's all we, we're going to be able to do, I'm afraid, this morning, because there's much to say. And if God wills, I'm hopeful that we can address this uh, the next time I'm up here. But um, for now, let's get straight into our study with the first point. Uh, the watchfulness is about conformity. And if there's only one thing that you take away from this, let it be this. That to be watchful as a believer, as a Christian, is to be scripturally aligned. To be watchful as a believer is to align your whole life to the word and the truth of God. It is to be submissive to the authority of Holy Scripture. 
verse 1 to 3. Now as to the times and the epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. First of all, note the two groups being talked about. You have no need of anything to be told to you. They are saying peace and safety. Destruction will come upon them. They will not escape. There's a language of you and them. Two very clear groups. One group requires no further information to their own benefit about impending disaster. The other group seems completely clueless to their own peril. One group is catastrophe savvy. The other group is catastrophe sloppy. Their attitude is casual and even contemptuous. But the bottom line is this. One group will escape the coming catastrophe. The other won't. What is this catastrophe? Paul calls it the day of the Lord. The Thessalonian Christians clearly were very familiar with this event because Paul says, you have no need for me to tell you about this. You know that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. And the, the, that phrase, full well, really means you have accurate understanding. You, you understand this fully, comprehensively. You've got this. The day of the Lord will, will come as a thief in the night and you know this. So does that mean the day of the Lord is a nocturnal event? Is God a thief? No. He's basically saying the day of the Lord will come when people least expect it. As a thief arrives unexpectedly and unannounced and takes his victims completely by surprise, so too will the day of the Lord ambush a lot of people, catching them unawares and off guard. Why will it ambush them? Paul says, while they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them. What does that mean? While they are saying peace and safety. It means that these people are overtaken by calamity because they are so cocksure about their own invincibility. They are so convinced that they are in their own minds of their own security, they believe that they have attained some sort of utopia or nirvana state that things really can't get better. I mean, I have nothing to worry about. They feel safe because they are resting on the laurels of human exploits in the fields of science and entertainment and philosophy and medicine and technology and politics and human affairs and they just feel that they've just got it all covered. So any talk of impending destruction is met with sneers and jeers and of derision, mockery and scorn. This is the 21st century, come on. Do you, really, do you really believe in these myths and superstitions? Come on. Come on. I mean, man is thinking of colonizing the moon. He's planning to go to the moon and you're just caught up in these fairy tales and folklore. Are you for real? While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child and they will not escape. These are the people who don't think it's necessary to be watchful, so disaster will hit them at the time they feel most secure. And there's also another reason. There's also another reason, and, and that is false prophets. They will come and give people that the idea and lull, themselves, lull them into a false sense of security, give them, give them false assurances that everything is just fine. It's fine. What are you worried about? And this isn't 
a problem that's just in the future. If you look at the Old Testament, throughout the history of Israel, this has been a problem where God, through His prophets, is trying to caution and, and make aware the nation of, nations of Israel and Judah that impending destruction is at hand, and you have false prophets who come in into, and speak into the ear of the king and say, it's all good. Don't listen to Isaiah. Don't listen to Jeremiah. Who are these guys? God is, God is telling his people, stop your idolatrous ways. Stop, stop, conform to my word. Or else, Babylon is coming. The Assyrians are coming. They're not bothered. No, 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 we're fine. We've got an alliance with Egypt. We, we've got it sussed. Jeremiah 6, 13 and 14 for from the least of them, even to the greatest of them, everyone is greedy for gain. And from the prophet, even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. They have healed the brokenness of my people superficially. And what do they say? Peace, peace. But there is no peace. Isaiah 48, 22. There is no peace for the wicked, says the Lord. It's clear. Ezekiel 13, son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel who prophesy and say to those who prophesy from their own inspiration. Tell them, listen to the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, woe to the foolish prophets who are following their own spirit and have seen nothing. O Israel, your prophets have been like foxes among ruins. It is definitely because they have misled my people by saying peace when there is no peace. In the Lord's day, people will be saying peace and safety. Because false prophets and others in authority are giving people false assurances and lulling them into a sense of false security. Any talk of doom and destruction is claimed as hate speech. We see that today, don't we? A time will come when when talk of the gospel will cease because it is deemed as hate speech. We can't anymore give people instruction and warning and caution because it will be outlawed. And when you live in a world and when you live in an environment where there is no word of God to give you caution, it's all good, right? No one else is going to warn you. People are more concerned about what's going to happen to the planet from a climate perspective to the detriment of their own souls. Because people have been lulled into a false sense of security, they will neglect to be watchful and destruction will overtake them with suddenness out of the blue. But just so we're clear, just so we're clear, what sort of disaster are we talking about? What is the extent of this calamity? Is it just um, an alarm? Ezekiel 30, 2 and 4. Thus says the Lord, wail. Wail. Alas for the day, for the day is near. Even the day of the Lord is near. It will be a day of clouds, a time of doom for the nations. Joel 2.31, the sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Isaiah 13, 9 to 13, behold, the day of the Lord is coming. It is cruel with fury and burning anger to make the land a desolation and he will exterminate its sinners from it. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not flash forth their light. The sun will be dark when it rises and the moon will not shed its light. Thus I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will also put an end to the arrogance of the proud and abase the haughtiness of the ruthless. I will make mortal man scarcer than pure gold and mankind than the gold of Ophir. Therefore I will make the nations I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will be shaken from its place at the fury of the Lord of hosts in the day of his burning anger. This is not something to be taken lightly. It's not something to be scoffed at. 
Acts 2.20, if you thought this was just Old Testament, Acts 2.20, the sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. Reginald E. Showers summarizes it like this, and I quote, the day of the Lord refers to God's special interventions into the course of world events to judge his enemies, accomplish his purpose for history, and thereby demonstrate who he is, the sovereign God of the universe, unquote. This is, this is international. This is global. It's going to be everywhere. It's not a single day. It's a period of time over which this destruction will take place. Well, what's the point of me saying all this? The point is, Ample warning has been given over and over and over again for thousands of years, and it has been ignored by millions and billions of people. And this is not the first time, by the way, that people have ignored warning. Noah preached for 120 years that destruction was coming. He built an ark. 120 years. A man is occupied, or something might just say he's just building it in his shed. That's just a hobby. No, no, no. This is massive. But no one believed him. In fact, Jesus makes note of this in Matthew 24. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. No difference. For as far for as, for as in those days before the flood. They were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will be the coming of men. As in the days of Noah, as was in the days of Paul, so too in our day, there will be two distinct groups of people, those who humbly heed, heed the warning of God and those who completely disregard it. Question is, which group do you belong to? It's a pretty simple uh, thing to get your head around. Destruction is coming. One group will be destroyed. One group will not. Where do I stand? Is your life conformed to Holy Scripture? Or is it conformed to unholy culture? Are you heeding the true word of God or are you dismissing it like the others who dismissed it in the days of Noah? Whose claims are you aligning yourself to? Because make no mistake, to disregard the word of God is to shake hands with the world. Yesterday, some of us were here and celebrated little Noah's birthday. And for you, those of you who weren't here, there was a, a little model ark over here. And it had little holes in where the portholes went. And, you know, you could poke your head through and take a picture. It's quite fun. And I don't mean this to be a, 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 an object lesson for Alex and Nia. But as I was just thinking, you know, this is... Uh, uh, how, what do I think of this, this piece of wood here? That's representing an ark. Is it something just uh, for a little fun and, and a moment where we can just have enjoy a birthday party? Or did this really happen? Is it true? Why is there this piece of wood over here? Is it because I read it in a fairy tale, Jack and the Beanstalk, you know, Thumbelina? I don't know. Do I really believe that thousands of years ago, the whole earth was covered in water. Do I really believe that? Do I really believe that one man spent 120 years building a boat and all the rest of the flora and fauna that we have on this planet came from there? Do I believe that? Or do I, do I believe in, in some naturalistic theory of evolution? Do I believe in a global disaster or do I think it was just a local thing that happened? What do I believe about Noah and his ark? 
Am I willing to be called a fool by the world of science which dis dismisses my claims as those as the rants of a lunatic? Am I only willing to associate myself with the biblical Noah and his ark because it makes a cute photograph? Or am I willing to associate myself with this event because it actually took place? It's history. It happened. It's a fact. It's undisputable. To what extent am I willing to, ex to accept the claims of this cataclysm? It's a vital question that everyone needs to answer because our attitude to what happened in the past will dictate our attitude to what is coming in the future. Are we terrified at the prospect of a flood that covers the highest mountain? Because if we are, then yes, we will be terrified of that fearful and wrathful day of the Lord. But if we treat the flood as, oh, I don't know, uh, I don't know, then you're going to be equally dismissive about the future. Turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 3, please. 2 Peter chapter 3, the, the, uh, chapter 2, verse 7, we just want to read that. The apostle makes it very plain to us about why we need to take scripture seriously. It's very clear. 2 Peter chapter 3. Why is watchfulness about conformity to Scripture? Peter makes it very clear. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 2. You should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets. You should remember it. And the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. Know this. Know it. Please know it. Make a, make a mark of it, put a bookmark in there, underline it. Know this first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts. They'll say it's science, they'll say it's humanitarian, they'll give you all sorts of examples, or all sorts of excuses, but the reason they are saying this is because they are following their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? I mean, for ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. What are you talking about all this doom and gloom? Everything's just fine. It's continuing as before. But when they maintain this, it escapes their notice. Hang on, you're forgetting something. Please, have you factored this fact into your analysis that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and by water through which the world at that time was destroyed. Have you forgotten that? Have you neglected to factor that in into your analysis? But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire. Kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of ungodly men. The certainty of future destruction is based on the reality of past calamity. We can be certain it will happen in the future because we can be certain that it's happened once before. And it requires a submissive and a humble heart to accept it and live according to it. In the same way that God promised calamity in the past and brought it to pass, saving only those who were faithful to him, so again he will bring calamity to pass in the future and he will save those who are faithful to him. Do you believe that? Do you believe and conform your life to the testimony of Moses or do you believe and conform your life to the testimony of Darwin? Are you with the mockers? Or are you with the believers? We need to understand here that there is no middle ground that we can occupy. There is no fence to sit on. There is no camp of refuge, of neutral position where we can park ourselves and, oh, I, don't, I want to be right, I don't want to be wrong. No, no, no. There is no neutral ground. There is not an inch of neutral ground anywhere in the universe. You are either for God or you are against Him. You have to take a call. You have to pick a side. 
You cannot think and delude yourself that you are just waiting to make a decision. Waiting to make a decision means you have made a decision. And how do we live? We live according to the side that we have picked. We conduct ourselves according to the culture and the conduct of the camp we're in. You can't profess to be a believer and then live like a mocker. You can't proclaim to have faith, but then live like those who are faithless. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be? 2 Peter 3, 11. Great question. Since all this is going to happen, what sort of people ought you to be? People who are conformed to God's truth. 2 Peter 3, 8 and 9. But do not let this one fact escape your notice. Don't let this one fact escape your notice. Beloved, that with the, day, with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about His promise. He is not slow. As some count slowness, but is patient towards you. He is not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. If you think that, oh, it's happened for thousands of years and nothing's happened. I mean, uh, Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel and Joel and all these people are you know, talking about it. And Peter saying the earth is going to be consumed and the Thessalonian church were waiting for the rapture and nothing's happened. Uh, I don't know. Is this going to happen or not? No, hang on. The, a day in the Lord's eyes is not like a day in yours. A thousand years is like a day. A day is like a thousand years. Don't count his slowness to be an empty threat. Because he is patient. And one day that threat will become a reality. A day is coming when unrighteousness will be judged. You know, this is not Star Wars. This is not where the rebels are the good guys. Let's understand that. Throughout, you know, Hollywood likes to pick, paint these pictures where the rebels are the good guys and they're fighting for a great cause and they're fighting against authority or bad authority and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm risking my life to save the planet. No, no, no. You are the rebel here. Our rebels will be punished. The good guys are those who watch to ensure that the practice of their lives conforms to the preaching of Scripture. Are you a watchful Christian? Before I leave, I want to give you a word of comfort and encouragement. And if you're thinking and sitting down here in your seat and thinking, you know, is the day of the Lord meant for me? Let me assure you, the day of the Lord is not intended for believers, but for unbelievers. And how do I know this? And so read the text with me again, all the way to verse 5, if you have your Bibles. Now as to the times and the epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying, peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness." Someone says, praise God for the butts in the Bible. Amen. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief, for you are all sons of light and sons of day. Amen. Praise God. The day of the Lord is intended only for those who do not confirm their lives to God's truth. It's clear. The, this day of wrath and fury and judgment is not for those who put their trust in Jesus Christ. Those who put their trust in Him will escape. Why? Colossians 1.13 God has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son He loves. Those who are no longer in darkness will be saved. Today we sang, I come by the blood. I come by the cross, where your mercy flows from hands pierced for me. That, that day of fury is, is not going to be in my future because that fury was poured out on the son who died for me.
Paul also makes this very clear in, in the previous chapter. And just turn there, turn there with me, if you will, to chapter 4, verse 13 onwards. Just, uh, we want to just read this quickly. Um, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren. We do not want you to be uninformed about those who are asleep so that you will not grieve as those who, as, as do the rest who have no hope. The, the, the Thessalonian church were, were, were waiting for Jesus to come again. You know, Paul went when he preached to them and I'm sure he would have told them, the Lord is coming again. And so they were waiting. Oh, sure, the Lord's going to come. He's going to come. And so some people died before that. And they're thinking, oh, hang on. Well, they've died before the Lord could come again. Is, are they going to share in his glory when he comes again? Or what's the, what's the deal here? You know, my, my, my family member or my, 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 my close friend who loved the Lord and they died, what's, what's their fate? And Paul says, you know, don't, don't, don't fret. Don't fret about those who are asleep because and don't grieve. Like those who have no hope. Why? For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. I'm, I'm not making this up. I'm giving you the word of the Lord, saying that we who are alive and remaining until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. This is going to happen. It's just not happening in the way that you think it is, but it's going to happen. The dead in Christ will rise first. If you pass away before the Lord comes, you will rise first. Can you, can you let that sink into you? When you're six feet under and the Lord returns, you will rise. Can that reality take a grip of your present? Can you live and, 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 and breathe and, and do everything that you're doing as someone who is going to rise? Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Do you believe that? Is your life conformed to the truth of this text? Or do you think, oh, come on, oh, yes, people, they're dead. They're dead. Dead is dead. Dead is doornails. Dead people don't rise. No, 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 they do. Because Christ rose. And he rose as the first fruits of those who are going to follow. And he rose to be an example and to let us know and give us the assurance that in the same way that God raised him up from the dead, he will raise us too who are in him. Paul assures them that the believers who pass away before Christ's return, will be equal participants in the glory that those have who are still living when Christ returns. And so this is an event intended only for believers, right? I mean, there's no evidence here that says that the unbelievers have any share in this. And so it's a separate event from the day of the Lord in chapter 5. And we know it's a separate event because in one event they had all the information that they needed. And the other event, they needed to be told. It's separate, it's different. So clearly Paul is talking about two separate events here. The first event is cause for hope and joy. And so we, we shall always be with the Lord. The second event is cause for fear and trepidation. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly. And they will not escape. The first event is about we and us. The second event is about they and them. We will meet the Lord in the clouds, but they will not escape. Two distinct occasions. One event is intended to rapture the faithful, caught away with the in the clouds. The other is a time of retribution for the faithless. Two different outcomes for two different groups of people. Again, question arises. Which group are we in? We have to ask that question. We have to. 
It would be foolish not to ask and not to answer. So I circle back to my original question. Are you being watchful by conforming your life to the truth of God's word? Or are you being negligent by conforming your life to the lies of culture? When God's word says that you are a sinner who needs to be saved from your sins, do you believe him? Do you believe that? Do you believe the things that we sang about and and the table that we just shared in? Or do you just believe like the rest of the world and say, nah, Nah, sorry, not buying that, no deal. When God says that there is no salvation to be found outside of his son, Jesus Christ, do you believe that? Or do you believe with the other religions and say, no, I think man can make it himself with his good deeds. I don't think Jesus is the only way. How can he be the only way? I don't believe God would be like that. When the Bible says that Christ died for sins, the just for the unjust, the righteous for the ungodly, do you believe that and cling to it as your only hope for eternal life? Or do you reject it, preferring instead to live for the here and now? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? When the bridegroom comes, will your robes be white? Can you sing, once your enemy now seated at your table? Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath is reserved for the day of the Lord. But it's no longer on me. The Father's wrath completely satisfied. Why? Because Jesus was there in the garden. Lord, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. What is he drinking? He's drinking the cup of God's wrath. Wrath. Unimaginable fury. So that we don't have to endure that fury. Once your enemy now seated at your table, Jesus, thank you. Make no mistake, Jesus will come to take his loved ones home, but wrath is also coming. And you would do well to heed God's voice in 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10. Turn from idols to serve a living and true God and wait for his son from heaven. Wait. He's coming. Wait. Wait for his son from heaven. Who is the son? It's the one whom he raised from the dead. That is Jesus who rescues us from the wrath to come. Wait for his son. Wait for Christ, because he rescues us from the wrath to come. This is the word of God. Are you willing to conform your life to it?